Welcome to Ask GAO Live. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in and join us today. My name is Sarah Kazmarek. I'm in our Office of Public Affairs. I'm joined today by Charlie Jezik, a director in GAO's Education, Workforce, and Income Security team. Charlie, thanks so much for joining us oh, today. Sarah. Sarah, it's my pleasure to be here. We're very happy to have you here. And today we're going to be talking about retirement security and some of the recent work that GAO has done on this. Charlie's team actually issued a report on Tuesday looking at managed retirement account services. So if you'd like a little more context for one of the reports we'll be discussing during our chat today, you can find that report on our website. Just look for the report number GAO-14-310. And again, that report came out on Tuesday on managed retirement account services. Before we get started, I'm going to talk about how you can send in your questions to us today. For those of you on social media, you can send them in over Twitter. Just use the hashtag AskGAOLive. You can also send them in over email to the email address AskGAOLive at GAO.gov. Thanks to those of you who have already sent in your questions over email and Twitter. We're going to do our best to get everybody a response today, so please do, throughout the chat, send us in your questions and comments. So, Charlie, before we get started, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work at GAO? Oh, yes, thanks, Sarah. Uh, yes, I've been at GAO now for, for over 29 years. Uh, I'm working on retirement security issues for the last 13 years. Uh, I have a PhD in economics. and. Uh, uh, I feel very passionate about the work that we do in our mission here. Now you have done a lot of work on retirement security. What are some of the recent topics that you've looked into? We've done a number of things recently. One, we, as, you, as you mentioned, Sarah, we did a, a major report on managed accounts. Uh, we've also looked at issues about the, the impact of, uh, of marriage, mar trends, recent trends in marriage and retirement security. And also we've done an evaluation of uh, uh, retirement security prospects, so the challenges uh, to uh, a secure retirement facing women workers in America. Could you tell me a little bit more about the managed account report that came out last week? What sorts of things did you look at and what did GAO find in this report? Sure. Uh, you could think of managed accounts really as like the next big thing in, in retirement. Uh, basically, managed accounts are a service where a trained professional rather than an individual uh, uh, directs the individual's investment funds. If you look at figure one, you'll see that typically in a 401k in scenario A, uh, an individual Send, you know, t has their contributions and they self-direct them. They decide whether to uh, put them all in a target date fund or a bond fund or wherever they'd like, whatever, according to the options of the plan. In scenario B, the individual provides access to uh, the, the contributions to a, uh, a managed account provider, a, serve, a professional, who then allocates those funds to different investment options. Well, we're going to go to questions now from the audience. And our first one is from Alex over email. And it is on this managed retirement accounts report. Alex would like to know, um, they say, I keep hearing about 401k plans that are offering managed accounts. What are they? And I know you, you've covered this a little bit, but if you could tell us again a little bit more about what managed accounts are. Well, managed accounts as a service uh, have been growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, if you go back to the 1990s, you look at figure two, uh, virtually there was one or two companies that provided uh, uh, a managed account option to plan participants. That's grown dramatically in the last 10 years. Today there are 12 different, uh, that we found, 12 different providers offering a managed account service to uh, plan participants. Uh, in 1990, or back I guess around 10 years ago, or 2005, about 25% of, of plan sponsors offered a managed account feature. Today that's up to 36%. And actually, if you look at total assets under management, managed accounts now oversee about $100 billion in assets. And I believe we also have another figure on this. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how common managed retirement accounts are now for, as an option? Well, uh, they are uh, uh, now. They're about 36 percent of all plan sponsors offer a managed account option. Uh, workers, uh, participants are certainly looking at it more closely uh, as to uh, whether the, uh, it's right for them. Uh, so it's really been growing dramatically, uh, particularly in recent years. Great. I'm going to go uh, to our next question from Robert over email, and Robert would like to know: of the eight managed account providers you surveyed. 
how many track returns resulting from their participant advice. Um, and of these managers, their total assets under management represents what percent of the total surveyed? Well, we did find that a number of them did track the performance uh, of, of managed accounts, uh, but they didn't provide us data that uh, we really uh, could look at it in more detail, so I can't really, I don't have a good sense of, uh, of, of the magnitude of, 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 the, of this uh, occurrence, but, it, but it did, we do know that the, some of the managed account providers did do so. Uh, our next question over email comes from Courtney, and Courtney would like to know, um, she says the report states that the additional services offered by managed account providers to participants in or near retirement could lead to potential conflicts of interest regarding, for example, how to spend down their savings in retirement. What kinds of conflict of interest is this referring to? Well, potentially, if um, you have a managed account pro uh, uh, provider, uh, they, they could continue to manage your account into retirement. And so you could have situations where the managed account uh, uh, provider would like to keep those assets under his or her own management and not, for example, have them go to some other investment opportunity, for example, the purchase of an annuity, which might, if for this particular individual, be their best choice. So there is potentially, uh, uh, given the, the individual situation and the other options available, uh, it, it's possible that you could have some man uh, conflicts of interest. Now, we did get a question over Twitter from Delphi Pensions, from John on Twitter, but I know this wasn't included in this report or in the previous reports you've done, so I'm going to go ahead and go to our next question that we received over email from Lindsay, and Lindsay would like to know, um, why should she consider a managed account? and what would some of the advantages be? Well, actually, a managed account can provide a number of advantages. For example, we know from the research uh, that uh, a lot of people with uh, account balance, with 401k uh, accounts now, really don't diversify as much as they should. And when they're in a managed account situation, the, the managed account provider, the advisor will, will help them to uh, uh, encourage diversification. So that's a positive uh, uh, thing for, for individual participants. Uh, similarly, we found that Individuals who choose a managed account service often save more. They're often more likely to take full account of the company's match. Uh, in a lot, of, a lot of cases, a lot of people don't take advantage of that. They essentially leave money on the table that the company is offering them. So they're more, at least they're more knowledgeable about this and they can take more advantage of, of the, uh, the match that might be offered in their plan. And finally, it really uh, it improves retirement readiness and financial literacy. The individual participant will get statements from the uh, uh, managed account uh, provider about uh, the, how ready they are for retirement, what they need to do. That, that generally can, contributes to better financial literacy and better retirement planning. So it sounds like there's a lot of benefits to these, especially for those of us who are not retirement mm -hmm. experts. Uh, I have to ask you, though, what would you say some of the drawbacks are? Well, I think one of the downsides is that right now uh, the managed account services are not a, a uniform product. So uh, you get different ser a different degree of service uh, depending on uh, what managed account provider your, your sponsor has chosen. It could be simply just personalized in general for you, or it could really get um, or customized, or it could be very personalized depending on your particular interests. Or in fact, it might be not be all that personalized at all. They may simply be allocating your money into investment options that you could just do on your own. None of these are, are problems except that uh, typically, because of this kind of managed account service, you're going to pay higher fees. And the other issue is, is that we've, about fees, is that we've seen uh, uh, fees are just all over the map. I mean, they can be very expensive managed account providers, uh, and, and, and they can be ones that charge very low fees. So it's hard for individual participants to assess the value of the account service uh, in, in comparison to the fees that they're paying. That sounds like a tricky situation where you can't really know, am I paying more than, say, another colleague who works somewhere else if they have the same service? Yes, and under the current regulations from the uh, Department of Labor, because managed accounts are a service and not an investment option, they aren't covered under the, the current regulations requiring some disclosure about, about fees and uh, uh, for different investment options. And one of the recommendations we made in the report is that individuals would be, should get more information about fees and also a, a benchmark information about how well the, their matched account uh, uh, service performs. 
I am going to turn now um, to a slightly broader topic we got over email from Liam. And Liam says um, in the past he ha had a lot of people he knew who mostly for retirement they had pensions. But now it seems like people more and more have to save for their own retirement with things like 401k plans or other investments. Is this change pe making people more or less secure as they prepare for retirement? Well, I think first it's important to uh, step back and understand that originally 401ks were a supplemental plan to traditional pensions. And as traditional pensions have disappeared, the 401k really has grown, or, or, or people are trying to have it grow to, to fill that vacuum of retirement security. The major change to an account-based system that, that, that we're moving towards is that the responsibility for, uh, for saving, for investing prudently, for contributing is now much more squarely on the part of the individual participant. And so over your lifetime, you really do, if you want to have a secure retirement, contribute faithfully to your plan. Or first of all, try to get a plan, make sure you have one or some other investment vehicle, uh, uh, retirement vehicle. Contribute to your plan, invest wisely. And then the other issue as you approach retirement is how do you spend the money down in retirement in a way that lasts your entire life, uh, you don't outlive your savings. So that can be quite challenging. Certainly, and um, I'm going to go to another question now from Richard over email, and Richard would like to know, is there any evidence that professional investment advice works? Indexing appears to consistently outperform active managers. Well, uh, you know, we have done some work in the past on target date funds. Increasingly, people are moving towards target date funds. Uh, so uh, there is some notion to at least uh, you don't have to think as much, uh, you don't have to make as many individual decisions in, in the context of target date funds. Uh, in the case of managed accounts, uh, you know, some of the, the, thing, the uh, benefits that I've mentioned earlier, uh, uh, I think, you know, certainly there, increased diversification, a tendency to save more. Uh, but in terms of actually comparing performance, we really didn't have that kind of data. I mean, we, there's a little bit that we, we, we mentioned in the report, but we really didn't have comprehensive data to compare uh, the performance of managed accounts with, uh, with other uh, investment uh, 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 strategies. It sounds like people really have to consider carefully whatever is going to be available to them, either through their employer or otherwise, when they're making these types of decisions. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you get an employer who offers you a plan. You First of all, you should definitely sign up for it. You should uh, contribute as much as you can. And then you have to figure out, you know, you really should take a good look, careful look at uh, the investment options your plan offers you and uh, the, the fees. And then also ask some questions about yourself. Uh, how much risk are you comfortable with? What are your long-term goals? Will you stay at the plan a long time? So on. Now, you did mention earlier you have done some work on marriage and retirement security. We have our first question that came in over email on this topic. The question is from Joanna, and Joanna would like to know, is it true that married people are more financially secure in retirement? And if so, how does that work? Well, I think that some, there are certain benefits to being married uh, that you don't have as a single person. Uh, first, uh, you, you can pool resources. You have two people as opposed to one. You can specialize in certain, certain areas. One person uh, uh, can uh, uh, work in, uh, maybe be, be able to work at home and, and help provide childcare services uh, more easily than, than the other person. So you can divide things up that way. And then the third thing is it, it it's it's it breaks your divides your risk up o uh, over two people in the labor market risk uh, uh, rather than one. So uh, if there's un one person one spouse is uh, unemployed, the other person is still working. So you, you still have some income going in uh, uh, over over uh, difficult uh, uh, financial or, or economic periods. So for all those reasons, there's just uh, more. Uh, you do have a lot of advantages being in, in a married situation. And I do think we have a figure on this. Uh, figure three, if we bring it up, um, shows a little bit about what you're talking about here. Could yes. you elaborate a little bit more? A a absolutely. I think figure three really uh, illustrates the advantages uh, uh, that I just outlined for being married. 
what figure three shows is the poverty rates for people over age 65. And you can see for uh, people who are married, both the men and women in total, uh, we're talking we're in a four to five percent range. If you look at people who are widowed, uh, it's more than double that. And then you get to divorced and, and the never married group is probably the, the highest. It's uh, the poverty rates for women who have never been married are four times uh, the poverty rates for, for women who, who are in married situations and are uh, over age 65. Uh, before we keep going with questions, I just want to remind people how you can continue to send in your questions today. Uh, you can send them in over Twitter using the hashtag AskGeoLive. And then again, our email address to send in your questions is AskGeoLive at geo.gov. Thank you so much for everybody who has been sending in your questions so far and your comments. We really do appreciate it. And I am going to turn back to our next question from the audience. Um, Going back to the issue of marriage, and mm -hmm. this question deals with the decline in marriage that we've seen over time. Um, so Stephanie over email asks, what do you think are the main causes of the decline in the rates of marriage today? Well, uh, this is actually a hotly contested topic uh, in the... In the I would in imagine. sociology, uh, uh, world of sociology, a lot of people have different theories. For the work that uh, we did for the uh, uh, for the particular congressional uh, committee that requested this, this was outside of the scope of of what we were going to do. Basically, we we were pretty much tasked with what are the trends and and what are the implications of those trends for retirement security, rather than you know why is it that fewer people are getting married today. Uh, uh, than they did say 30, 40 years ago. Fair enough, definitely not an easy question to <laughs> answer. I am gonna go back to talking about managed accounts and take another question that came in from Robert over email. Robert would like to know, did GAO in the course of the study that you were doing identify any managed account providers that tracked their returns but are not publishing them? Um, if so, these managers' total assets under management represent what percent of the total surveyed? We did find some ma managers who did collect this information, some uh, managed account providers. They didn't provide that information to us during our work uh, uh, in any uh, uh, you know, way that, we, we could, that was something that we could use for the report. We do know, however, that the, the, the companies that, that, uh, that said they did this would be willing to provide that information to plan sponsors. So presumably there's the sponsors who have them as the managed account provider uh, are, are getting this information. Coming back to um, talking about different demographics with retirement, we have a question from Gregory over email and Gregory would like to know, are there particular groups of Americans who are at greater risk for poverty in old age? Well, I think the uh, one, looking at the work we did on marriage, uh, one group is uh, is, is certainly single women. Uh, if again, uh, uh, if you uh, single women uh, are, uh, as we've just seen just previously, uh, their poverty rates are far higher uh, than uh, for other groups. Uh, this is often for uh, uh, for minority women, African American women uh, who are single. This is probably uh, uh, again a group there that that has uh, uh, higher rates of poverty. So those are probably some of the the, the key groups that we we focused on in that work. And I'm going to uh, pull up another figure that relates to this. I think figure four shows some of these trends in poverty and old age. Could you tell us a little bit more about what we're seeing in this figure here? Well, in figure four, actually, one of the things is in this situation is sort of what can single women do to uh, avoid poverty and retirement? And uh, one of the first thing is that we now know that single women work a whole lot more than they used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a good thing because uh, they're going to get higher wages. They still don't get the wages that men do, and so that's a, uh, that's a problem. But they, they are working, and so they have the opportunity to save for retirement. And if any, so if you look at this figure, you see that single women now pretty much have, uh, have, have caught up with, uh, with, uh, uh, with single men in terms of uh, 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 labor force participation. So working more and also saving more if they're in a if, if they're in a 401k plan they should definitely take advantage of, the, of, 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 of contributing as much as they can invest wisely uh, because women tend to live longer too they may want to work longer uh, to build up more social security credits 
uh, uh, that will allow you a higher benefit from Social Security when you go into uh, into retirement. But probably working and saving more, probably the two the two number the two things that single women uh, can do uh, to uh, minimize the, the threat of poverty in retirement. Well, we have a related question that came in over email from Brenna, and Brenna would like to know, she says, I have some older female relatives who are divorced or widowed, and should she be worried about their ability to retire comfortably? Well, we know that uh, uh, for people who are married, uh, uh, divorce or widowhood is a tremendous shock to their uh, retirement prospects. And the work that we did in our Women in Retirement report uh, in both cases, uh, uh, the drop in income after widowhood or, uh, uh, or divorce is in 35 to 40 percent range, and it's much higher for women than for men for a variety of reasons. They, work, they, uh, they have lower wages, they don't work as much uh, historically, and so uh, the, the shock of widowhood or divorce can really be devastating for, uh, for women in terms of their retirement prospects. That does sound like a very difficult situation. And um, I am going to go back to another question that we got from Robert over email. And Robert would like to know, has GEO considered how plan advisors duplicate the services of a managed account provider? To what extent do you think they will be subject to any new proposal um, or guidance from the Department of Labor for managed accounts? Well. During the course of our work on managed accounts, we were aware of some of the uh, developments among uh, uh, the uh, uh, plan administrators here. Uh, we really, uh, was, that was really outside the scope of our report. And, you know, people hadn't really understood what managed accounts were previously, so that really was our central focus. Certainly, labor in its, uh, 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 as we recommended to labor to have, uh, to make, uh, to basically require managed account providers to provide uh, uh, fee information, benchmarking information. They could include some of these plan administrators as well, but right now we don't know to what extent labor uh, plans to do that. Let me ask you a little bit more about the recommendations your team made in this report. Did you make other recommendations, or was that the main recommendation that you made? Well, I think those, there were two, the, the, the two, we did have a, a couple of other recommendations. We found that some of the management account providers did not provide the same level of uh, fiduciary responsibility as others. Uh, and to, to, to avoid getting too technical, uh, uh, too lawyerly here, uh, there, are, there are different levels of fiduciary responsibility, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, that this that uh, the Department of Labor addressed that issue. Mm -hmm. The major recommendations that we made on that report, though, was that both to plan sponsors and to, uh, plan participants and plan sponsors that information on fees for managed service uh, managed account services, as well as benchmarking information, be provided to those groups. And finally, the other thing that we recommended, which we think is important to foster competition among managed service providers, is that uh, plan sponsors should ask their plan administrators to uh, uh, get op options to, uh, uh, from other managed account providers rather than the one that the plan administrator is recommending. So you have uh, 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 sort of fee choices from more than one managed account provider. And while we didn't recommend that this be a mandate, uh, we thought that it would be useful for plan sponsors if they couldn't get any other uh, 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 quotes from other managed account providers from their plan administrator to provide that to the Department of Labor. There's a lot of good recommendations in that report. I am going to go back to the topic of marriage and Alicia sent a question over email and she would like to know if marriage is such an important factor in retirement, is the government doing anything to encourage people to marry or stay married? Well, uh, again, that was outside the the, the, the scope of our uh, the scope of our report. Uh, you know, probably uh, certainly uh, uh, creating jobs, job creation is something that will encourage keep people together. Uh, uh, you know, and so that's something. Uh, but other than that, but that really was outside the scope of our report. And another question that may be a little hard to yeah. answer. Uh, I'm going to come back to 401ks, and mm -hmm. Steve asked. If I leave my job, what options do I have for my 401k plan savings? Okay, there's actually a number of options uh, uh, that one has uh, in most cases when they leave a plan. They, uh, they can leave their money 
with their old provider, old for uh, their old plan, although sometimes the plans don't like that and they sort of encourage you to take the money out. They can roll their money over uh, or to the, a new company if the new company offers a plan. Uh, they can cash the money out, which probably for most people is, is the, uh, the, real, the least best uh, uh, outcome. Uh, you do uh, pay extra tax on it, and, and you're, obviously you're draining your, your retirement savings. And the last option is to roll the money over into an IRA. Now, um, you mentioned earlier that you have to both think about saving enough for retirement when you are working, but then also how you spend the money <coughs> once you are retired. So I have a question from Craig over email, and Craig would like to know, is it better to take Social Security benefits as soon as possible, or should you delay taking those benefits? Well, we did uh, a report recently looking at, at early claimers, and one of the things we found that I think about 40% of uh, people who claim Social Security, I think about 40% claim it within the first year. I think there's a lot of things to keep in mind an individual's health, how long you're going to live. Uh, uh, you know, if, you, if someone is able to wait from age 62 or to wait to age 70, uh, their benefit would be 100, almost 175% higher than what they would get in age 62, and that's really quite significant. Uh, even if they wait to age 66, it's, it's going to be far greater than, than what they get at age 62. The problem with taking your benefit at age 62 is, if you're a fairly low wage worker, is uh, even though the Social Security is fully indexed for inflation, there's the potential that later in life uh, you may, uh, uh, that benefit given rising health costs and so on, that, that benefit might not be enough for you to avoid poverty in retirement. It's very difficult to go back to work, say, when you're, you know, say over 80 years of, uh, of age. So there are a lot of things to keep in mind. Uh, you know, in general, other work that we've done, you know, the annuity, basically the annuity value of waiting a year uh, 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 postponing Social Security benefits is, is it's far cheaper to do that than if you went out and bought, a, a, bought an annuity in the market. So uh, there are a lot of things to consider. Uh, I think in general, though, for most people, probably waiting, uh, waiting is going to result in, in, a much, in, a, in a larger retirement income. Well, we have time for a couple of questions now uh, before we wrap up today. I'm going to go one more from the audience, and uh, Kwame over email asks, what are some of the main challenges preventing older workers today from being financially secure in their retirement? Well, I think one is that uh, uh, we, uh, traditional pensions have been disappearing. Uh, we did have the financial crisis in uh, 2008. Uh, for people who were retiring around that time, that was, uh, uh, if they had to retire, then they, they, they likely suffered a huge financial loss. Uh, it requires people to invest wisely over their career, to contribute over their career. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. You know, a lot of people haven't had the opportunity or, or been able or willing to do that. And so these are, these are, these are challenges. And we, we hope now in the future, uh, given the work we do and, and uh, that, that the growth of the 401k system, that people will start looking at this more closely, the l financial literacy about saving for retirement, hopefully will encourage people to do so. But these are many, many major challenges uh, uh, the facing workers. Well, Charlie, I've got to ask you one more question. Um, thinking about sort of the bottom line here as people are preparing for retirement or thinking about retirement, what do you see as sort of that main takeaway message for them? Well, I think the bottom line is, is that if, you have, if you're lucky enough to have a, a, a 401k plan, you should save as much as you can. Try to contribute faithfully year in and year out. It's very difficult. People have a lot of competing needs. There's mortgages, student loans, just basic sp expenditures of daily life. But to the extent that you can save, or at least save to the, to the level the, of, to, to get the complete company match, that's something I would do. Uh, the, the second thing I would do is, is try to invest wisely. And there are a lot of ways to do that, become more financially literate, target date funds, uh, managed accounts. All of these are possibilities uh, uh, to help people manage their, their, uh, their income wisely. And then to, to plan for re retirement. When, when you retire, what do you, what do you want to do with that money? Have a strategy for spending the money down, either doing it systematically on your own, 
purchasing an annuity uh, or, or investing it in, in retirement, uh, uh, doing something so that your account, your, your money lasts you your entire life. Well, that's some very good advice for all of us. And Charlie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My pleasure. Really appreciate having you here on the show. And thanks, everybody, who tuned in and watched today and to those of you who sent in your questions and comments. If you have any feedback for us, you can send that to askgeolive at geo.gov. And for more from the Government Accountability Office, you can stay connected with us online at gao.gov. We're on Twitter at USGAO. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash USGAO. We're also on LinkedIn, and you can even subscribe to our blog at blog.gao.gov. Thank you so much for taking the time again to join us and send us your questions. We hope you tune in again next time. Thanks for watching Ask GAO Live. Stay connected with GAO for information about future Ask GAO Live chats.